Now, I am sure everyone here has seen fictional flying aircraft carrier concepts, from the Arsenal Bird to the CL-1201, and even the 747 aircraft carrier, and even, like, the Heli Carrier from Marvel. Flying aircraft carriers really have been notably prevalent in modern media. So you know what? I decided to take my own crack at it. But for those joining this channel for the first time, you might know that just making a flying aircraft carrier is just the beginning of it. This behemoth will need to carry upwards of 100 parasite fighters. It will also need to be able to physically take off from standard large runways or just conventional runways. That sounds like a pretty boring goal, but honestly it was probably the hardest part of this challenge. Lastly, I want this aircraft to have a large docking bay and retrieval boom in the hangar, that way all parasite fighters can be retrieved after any sorties. And last but not least, I'll save it for another episode of course, but I do want to build a parasite fighter to operate within this aircraft. Of course, any parasite fighter or other aircraft operating within such a vehicle doesn't need landing gear and prioritizes space saving. Data link and other operating features would be prevalent among the swarm. But that's, again, for another episode. And for those of you who have known me for a while, welcome back to the next video. I have been absent for a bit because I was working on the flyout trailer, but we're back. And what better thing to come back to than probably the most ambitious project I've ever done in flyout. For now though, let's just focus on the Sky Carrier. So a few things about the design though. Due to the size and weight of this aircraft, I've decided that it's probably going to be nuclear turbines and that would be what's optimal for this design. Now a lot of you who haven't watched my Sky Cruise video or might just not know about it might be saying, what? Nuclear turbines? What are those? Or maybe not, I don't know, a lot of people have heard about them nowadays. But anyways, that's not the point. Nuclear turbines essentially just exchange heat from the decaying of fissile materials, such as maybe plutonium or uranium, and radiate that heat through a turbine combustor. In doing this, you entirely replace the need for fuel on board your aircraft. Problem is, this requires a very heavy and very exotic cooling system. Or rather, should I say, just heat exchange system. Also, the radiation shielding aboard the aircraft would be very heavy. These two reasons, on top of the concern of a nuclear disaster in the event of a crash, prevented these styles of aircraft from ever being made in real life. Also, there are a few other operating features that may not be ideal, such as very long spool times and things like that. Throttle may not be too controllable, but most of that is unknown since we haven't really designed them. Anyways, ignoring that last one, lucky for us, our aircraft is already huge and it's already heavy. Seeing as its orientation is long-range strategic attacks on opposing nations, chances are radiation is not particularly concerning to us either, at least from anything but a moral angle. But you know what? Sure, that's a good deterrent not to shoot it down. Oh, if you shoot down our Sky Carrier, we're just gonna irradiate your entire countryside with it. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. Totally won't result in any nuclear retaliation or anything, right guys? Haha. Ha. 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 Okay, maybe it's not a good idea. But either way, it's probably going to be flying over the ocean hundreds of miles away from the shore, just close enough to get the parasite fighters within range. So you know what? I think that's fine. Oh, speaking of which, this craft is also part of the previous alt history concept I was working on. Jet turbines will remain single spool, non-afterburning turbojets with low to moderate combustor temps at best. The skies are ruled by subsonic aircraft, save for the occasional rocket interceptor, high altitude reentry vehicle, or maybe even just barely subsonic super cruising turbojet. This also gives us a chance to use fictional roundels on this aircraft. Also, the technology level I am aiming for in this aircraft, at least in terms of electronics and avionics, is around the late 70s, where the electronic age is finally being felt in aircraft. This flying aircraft carrier is supposed to act as an AWACS for all of its parasite fighters through a primitive form of early data link as well. Therefore, later in the design, radar sensory equipment is set up all around the aircraft. Alright, before we start talking about what I'm actually building on screen here, let me sum up some of the design features we had mentioned earlier. Our aircraft needs to carry a large sum of parasite fighters, or at least simulated parasite fighters in weight. Employ the use of turboprops, or any single spool non-afterburning nuclear turbojet configuration. It needs to take off from a conventional runway, preferably at full loading weight. And lastly, it needs to integrate a full launch and docking bay for any aircraft to simultaneously take off and land. Or should I say dock, since there's not really a landing pad on this aircraft. Anyways, that's not really the point, is it? The point is, now we can actually explain what we're working on here. 
All right, so here on screen, we're actually designing the turbines and the turbine quote unquote pods that we'll have on this aircraft. So to put it simply, each pod will contain two turbines, two four meter diameter, which is gigantic by the way, turbines. And each of these two turbines will be powering a counter rotating turboprop in the back. And all of this, as you can see, is being kept within this little pod that we're using on the aircraft. The idea behind this is each turbine with the two turbines on the side and the intakes and the exhaust on the side will have a nuclear reactor essentially sitting in the middle in between them. The heat exchanger or the cooling system or whatever you want to call it will then run between the two turbines and this will allow it to do so as efficiently and as lightweight as possible and with as little radiation shield as possible. Of course, while still keeping it safe. Can't forget to mention that. The front of this pod will contain a flap with an emergency radiator that opens up in the event that the nuclear reactor gets a little bit too hot. Obviously, if we've learned anything from nuclear disasters of the past, keeping a nuclear reactor cool in emergency situations is one of the most important things you can do. So, obviously, I'm not going to do this without several redundant systems for that. The front pods may contain these uh, radiators, and a radiator system that goes through the wings to all turbines should also be employed in case of an emergency. Of course, none of this can really be modeled in Flyo other than basic models, so therefore I will just model it in weight. Also, it is important to note that nuclear turbines are not in Flyo, and instead I am doing this through a series of combustor temp changes as well as the use of the unlimited fuel debug system. So once again, similar to the cooling system, it is merely simulated. All of what I say here about how it would work is mostly just simulated, so you're not going to really see any of that in the build. Although it is important to know, I do end up adding the radiators in a model for a little nuclear system in the middle of each of these pods. I think you saw me messing with the paint a little bit there. Basically, I was just having some problems with the painting system, and then I made it a sub-assembly so I could make copies of the turbines, and then it didn't really work out, so I just kind of gave up on actually painting the turbines. I also later on end up testing and adjusting the turbines, a and, and especially the propellers a little bit, to make them as efficient as possible for this aircraft. The tips of the propellers still end up breaking mock, but trust me, it's actually just about as efficient as I can get it without making it subsonic, that is. And while subsonic would be more efficient, it just wouldn't generate enough thrust to keep this thing in the air. So, yeah, this thing would be insanely loud, but that's beyond the point. Either way, we had all of our wing pods, and we ended up having a total of 8 nuclear reactors and 16 nuclear turbines, which would total to 8 counter-rotating propellers powered by this system. Here at the beginning of the video, at this current point at least, you can see that I only put on 6, but that soon changes to 8. Also, you know what, before I forget to mention it, the uh, game I'm using to model this aircraft is known as Flyout. Flyout is not released to the public yet. It is an early access flight design game that is hyper-realistic and has, in my opinion, better flight performance and physics than any other flight game on the market at the moment. Well, at least when regarding flight building games. Obviously, it's hard to beat a well-designed, hard-coded flight model, but in terms of, let's say, KSP and Simple Planes and other similar building games, this one is absolutely the best modeled. Well, back to the Sky Carrier here. As you'll notice, this thing is pretty big. It's almost impossible to actually tell in the editor since there's no references, but this thing has a wingspan of over 500 meters. I'm sure by now in the video, or if not earlier, I have definitely shown some images for just the sheer sense of scale on this thing. Because it's honestly hard to wrap your head around sometimes. This puts our aircraft at about a halfway size between the CL-1201 and the Arsenal Bird. So, either way, you see what I'm saying, this thing is gigantic. Here on screen, you'll see that I'm starting to design the tail section of the aircraft. Originally, I wanted a single vertical stabilizer and maybe a T-tail similar to the 1201, but later on I decided on a twin boom instead. Or I guess in a way it was a tri-boom because it was braced by the inner fuselage as well. So here it is, we have two booms coming out of the wing and then the main empennage section in the back. There will be a little wing or a little control surface, I guess, between the empennage and the booms that would essentially act not only as a control surface, but also as a brace for the booms. And then on the end of the booms, there will be 
larger all-flying control surfaces that'll allow us simply for just better manipulation of our direction because that's needed in an aircraft this big. And lastly, of course, two vertical stabilizers will go on either tail boom in order to give us some vertical stability, or rather, side slip stability. At this point in the build, all I'm doing is making the landing gear bay, the landing gear doors, and the internal launch bays for the Parasite Fighters. So that also gives me a chance to explain exactly how this Parasite Fighter system is going to work. So there's going to be two bays on board this aircraft. Logically thinking, since docking takes far longer than launching takes, I will have a general purpose bay and then a docking bay on the top. Both the general purpose bay and the docking bay will have cranes on them. And these crane booms essentially just act as grab and lock the aircraft as they're flying alongside the sky carrier. Now exiting the launch bay, you have literally the entire fuselage of the aircraft that's mostly open, as well as a little bit into the roots of the wings. All this area in here, while I can't exactly model it, or at least I don't exactly model it in this part of the video, is essentially where the aircraft are going to be stored on this build. And of course it won't only be aircraft, it will be armament and it will also be fuel for the aircraft, but you get the idea. I would not be able to actually put any parasite fighters or aircraft into the bay of this thing, maybe one, and this is for a few reasons. Firstly, flyout at the moment cannot handle controlling multiple vehicles at the same time. The command centers, or the command block, or the jimmy, or whatever you want to call it, it, it just isn't set up for it basically. The second reason is if I tried to put multiple highly detailed aircraft within the inside of this thing, the game would literally lag itself into oblivion. We're already teetering at the edge of what's possible with this thing, and I don't want to take it over that limit. So instead, to uh, get around all that, we'll just have to stick with a simulated weight for whatever's in the bay. For this simulated weight, we end up using two gigantic drop tanks on fixed hardpoints. These drop tanks each weigh in to about 1,500 tons, and there are two of them, so that makes up about 3,000 tons of weight, of takeoff weight on this aircraft. And that's just in payload. That doesn't even count the fuselage, the fuel, any of that. Just the payload weight. So that's presumably 3,000 tons of fuel, of armament, and of fighter aircraft, and maybe even some other aircraft for the inside of this thing. I did the math out using the modern F-18 Hornet and its full payload weight. Realistically, 3,000 tons should be more than enough to operate 100 F-18 Hornet aircrafts for multiple sorties with enough fuel and armament capabilities to cover all of them. And considering that the aircraft inside this would be purpose-built to be lightweight and probably even smaller than the F-18 since, I mean, they don't have afterburners, they're going to be either rocket-powered or turbojet-powered. So realistically, we could probably arm even more Parasite Fighters or aircraft on board this thing, but I don't think we'd actually have the space for that. I'll have to do the math in another video, maybe the video where I designed the Parasite Fighter. So for now, this simulated weight is just a testament to what this aircraft really can do. But you know what? Going back to the aircraft as I here design the landing gear, it's important to note that our biggest challenge right now is actually just taking off in the space of a real-life runway or a conventional runway. Now realistically, I don't think conventional runways would really be built for this thing, but uh, we still want to take it off from one just in the case of an emergency or just to prove the capability of the aircraft overall. Due to the sheer static friction and rolling resistance generated from the landing gear of this thing, I would need a lot of thrust to even get moving. While this wasn't exactly a problem for these turboprop engines, it did make taking off on the length of a standard runway a problem. We'd essentially need S-tall capabilities to even take off on a conventional runway with such a behemoth of an aircraft. So what I did was essentially I just added JATO boosters to it. For those of you who don't know, JATO boosters are essentially little rocket packs that you attach to the side of an aircraft in the event of taking off in a very short distance. These rocket packs burn for a few seconds, or not a few seconds, sometimes longer, sometimes a few seconds, it, it really depends on the JATO, but that's not the point. Basically they just burn, and then you get off the ground, and then they drop off your aircraft for, you know, the sake of weight and aerodynamics, and then you just go. So they're little rockets that help you get off the ground. 
I added those under the wings of this aircraft to help it get off the ground. That's all you really need to know. Anyways, we've already spent a ton of time talking, so what happened was I basically ended up doing a bunch of stuff off camera. That way in this time lapse, I don't give everyone a seizure from being at like 20 times speed. It's only eight and a half times speed for this one. Nice and manageable, everyone can handle that. But that means you guys don't get to see any of the interior building, the decoration building, the paint, the detail, any of that. So just so you know, all of that is done off camera. Now we are done and we are ready to fly. Here it was, our final product. On takeoff, this thing generated more thrust than the Saturn V moon rocket. You want to talk about pure insanity and absurdity, it is 100% this build. Like I literally have to steer to the right on takeoff here just to avoid hitting the tower on takeoff. I learned that the hard way the first time I flew this thing when my wing clipped the tower and I went into a flat spin immediately. Thank goodness for these JATO boosters though, because they actually enable me to take off in the distance of the runway. Either way, our mission here is pretty simple and will not take up too much time today. All it is is getting up to altitude and then simply deploying the bomb bay, or launch bay rather, and then dropping our payload and then returning. Or just dropping the payload, it can just end right there honestly. There's no technical way to add any parasite fighters or retrieve them or any of that, so what else is there to do, you know? Either way, we're very much in the air now, this JATO boost has dropped off, and we are flying towards our cruising altitude now. This thing all in all climbs pretty well. If I remember correctly, its climb rate is right around 10 to 15 meters per second with those turbine engines. And it was pretty quick too, it could get to fairly high subsonic speeds with ease. Of course, I don't believe it was quite as fast as the Sky Cruise, for example. When I tested it, it only hit up to about Mach 0.6, whereas the Sky Cruise, I don't know, it went up to about 0.85, so it's definitely a bit slower than Sky Cruise. But for what it is, this 500 meter long, actually 570 meter long behemoth that literally lags my game simply by existing, I'd say that's pretty good. And yeah, the game's lagging, but the fact that the game can even handle such an aircraft is impressive on its own. So basically, this aircraft would be able to take off from anywhere in its home country, from whoever these roundels come from. And I would prefer if it flew over the ocean, but either way, it could fly across continents or ocean, all the way across the world if it wanted to, in order to patrol or defend any airspace for any conflict going on on that country. In a time and an age in this world where everything is turboprop or rocket powered or just simple jet powered, this enables the Air Force to mobilize far quicker than it would ever be able to. With the AWACS tower on top, this aircraft could effectively communicate to all of the Parasite fighters accurate positions of enemy aircraft. For me, this makes it feel like the Hive and the Parasite fighters almost like a swarm of angry hornets or something. Because in a way, they're all linked together and they're all linked to this airship. Which unfortunately does seem like a weak point, because if this airship in any event is taken down, then its parasite fighters would probably be blind. Or maybe not blind, I'd imagine they may include lower power radars on them. But their effectiveness and their visibility of enemy targets is definitely significantly reduced, unless there's another AWACS in the area. But either way, now we were at our cruising altitude, or at least close enough to our cruising altitude, so we're just going to open that bomb bay and drop off those drop tanks. The drop tanks were weighing us down a ton, and they were just meant to simulate all of the aircraft and all of the armaments and all of the fuel that they could possibly be carrying. So basically, with these drop tanks loaded, this thing was essentially at maximum weight it could ever fly at. But considering that either way we were able to climb to our cruising altitude or close to our cruising altitude at a relatively fast pace and still achieve a fairly decent speed while doing so, I'd say that we have more than enough thrust for this. 
Plus, if you've ever looked at the size of the wings on this thing, I mean, the wingspan is almost 100 meters wider than the actual length of the aircraft. Actually, I think it is over 100 meters wider. So it generates more than enough lift, so obviously that's not a problem. But for now, that's just about all I can do with this thing. For those who have watched till this point, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it, and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.